Hello, this is Pick, and welcome back to my guide for FTB Neotech. Let's start the day off right with a good breakfast. How about some juice? Well, I guess it's the end of the day in game, but if you want some easy food, a juicer can get you a variety of decently saturating foods. The easiest of these is sweet berry juice, but carrot juice is also fairly simple, and you can even get fruit punch. Now that we're all nourished, we have a job to do. Uh, a quick statement fixing something I said in the previous episode. I said that the bug regarding putting a repair material in the uh, wood cutting cart was fixed. Like if you have the uh, repair material in the slot while it's running. I think that bug is still around, so you're gonna have to be wary of that. Hopefully it gets fixed sometime in the future, but for now, not much we can do. Now then, my inventory is very cluttered, so how do we fix that? Well, I can make a backpack from sophisticated backpacks. If you don't have any leather from cows, you can always make some from uh, hemp turning into tough fabric, and then that around a honeycomb. Honeycombs are pretty easy to get, and as a tip, if you need bees, plant some flowers near your tree farm. As long as you're growing an oak or birch tree, it will spawn beehives. Backpacks can be upgraded in numerous ways. You can increase the storage capacity as well as give it various upgrade items that let it do different things like automatically pick up blocks that it has on the ground or have you compact things together to store more inside it. There are a lot of them and you can just look at the whole list and do what suits your needs. Now I'm going on a quest for slime balls. You might see that I'm going away from the swamp, but that's because I have a swamp near my base that's Y level is way too high for me to actually have it spawn slimes. Ultimately, I scrapped this though, as going for slimes wasn't a very profitable venture. There simply wasn't another swamp close enough to me for it to be worth going to. Instead of a swamp, I can craft slime balls from aloe. Aloe is found within tropical gardens from Pam's Harvest Craft and you can find those on beaches, primarily. You might be able to find them in deserts too, but beach biomes are your best bet for finding it. You can then grow more of it like any other crop. With all of this together, I can make a pickup upgrade. This makes it much easier to do a large variety of tasks. Mining, for example, you can pick up all of that extra stone you're getting on the ground, and just have room for more ores in general, of course. I would recommend upgrading the backpack tier as well. Gold if you can afford it, iron if you can't. You might want to look into the other upgrades as I said before, but this is the main one I would make right now. Alright, let's build a multi-block, shall we? The first one we're going to make is the coke oven. This is going to turn coal into a coal coke. The one from modern industrialization requires steam to work, whereas you can also use the immersive engineering one, which doesn't need anything other than the coal of course, but it's much slower. I would definitely recommend making at least a couple, that way you can have higher throughput, but thankfully they can share walls, so you can just build them touching each other. They can't share ports however, so be sure to design it with that in mind. The blocks above and below the controller should be fine, and if you hold the wrench in your offhand you can see a hologram of what the multi-block is supposed to look like. You'll probably have noticed that I'm still using a regular vanilla furnace to smelt the wood into charcoal at the tree farm. Of course, there's something I'm going to replace it with, an enchanted vanilla furnace. By enchanting the furnace with speed 3, I can make it quicker and have it handle pretty much all of the wood that comes in from the tree farm. All I need to do is go into the quest book, trade some honeycombs for some speed books, and combine everything together in the anvil. This will allow me to, of course, get the furnace with speed 3 on it. There are other options you could use, like solar radiance, which allows it to not even need fuel if it's daytime, but I think for right now, it's perfectly fine to just have speed 3. Who's ready to make an absolute ton of fire clay again? I hope you are, because that's what we're about to do. I'm going to be making a steam blast furnace, and of course, that requires an absolute ton of fire clay bricks. They're also just good to have in general. An important thing to make before I get to that fire clay though is the mixer. The mixer is going to give us a higher yield on our solid based mixing recipes 
as well as allowing us to make fluid mixing recipes, among other things. There are a lot of good recipes the mixer has that are useful, though of course we want it for that increased yield. It's going to be useful for both getting more fire clay and getting more steel when we eventually get to that. Another thing that I can make with the mixer is Primogel goo. This lets us make primal coal, as well as ferricore ingots, or should I say raw ferricore that we can turn into ingots. To use the goo, it's fairly straightforward. All you have to do is place down the block of goo, place down the block you want to convert next to it, and slowly but surely, the block will get consumed by the goo and transform into the thing you want it to turn into. Note that fortune does not affect drops gotten from this crafting method. It will always drop a random amount of stuff from, I believe, 3 to 4. Since the steam blast furnace runs on steam, it follows all the rules of the other steam machines. The coke oven does as well. If you use a steel steam import hatch, you can actually double the speed at which steel is produced. In addition, you can right-click on the controller with gunpowder to double the speed at which it crafts. To make steel in the steam blast furnace, you're going to need uncooked steel dust that is made in the mixer with iron dust and coke dust. And again, you want to be using that mixer recipe because you get two extra steel dust per input ingredients. Like with the coke oven, you're probably going to want to have some side sharing between these machines. However, that might prove a little difficult to have more than two sharing just because of the nature of how many ports you're going to need. So I would at least have two of them share and then have the rest just be on their own. There will be a point where we can graduate from using the steam blast furnace anyway. This also enables us to create steel upgrades now. These machines are simply put twice as good as their bronze counterparts. You're going to want to upgrade as many of your machines as possible, and of course make use of the free quest reward steel upgrades that you can receive for having progressed this far. How much steam-based infrastructure you want to produce is going to be your choice. I personally will lean on making more steam-based infrastructure, but if you want to rush into electricity, well, we'll get to that, but it is something that's possible to shoot for. To upgrade a bronze machine to a steel one, simply shift right click on it with a steel upgrade and it will upgrade the machine in the world for you. Another thing to note is that certain select machines, like the steel furnace, do not need to be upgraded from their bronze components. You can craft those directly. So if you want to save on materials, it might be beneficial to make your furnaces as steel instead of bronze. With the ability to make more steel comes the ability to make more item pipes. This means that I could set up some limited barrels to handle all of the stuff being produced by the tree farm. Again, I would rather use the modern industrialization barrels, but these work better, so unfortunately that's my option. It is also far easier to upgrade these. With all of that in place, it's time to get into the realm of electronics. We're not 100% there yet, but a wire mill is going to make us be able to make, well, wires, obviously. For now, I guess you can just stick to one of some of these machines, though when we do get to start automating things, of course we're going to want many, many, many more of them. Of course, when we have a wire, we have to insulate that wire, otherwise it doesn't really serve much of a point, now does it? So, we're going to make some rubber by using synthetic oil. Synthetic oil is made by putting raw synthetic oil through the steam blast furnace, and raw synthetic oil is coke dust and water through the mixer. Oh, also, hold on to any creosote you're making, you're gonna want a stash of that too. But because we have so many useful byproducts, that shouldn't be a problem. While you get an okay yield of rubber by using synthetic oil, you can use silver to process that oil into synthetic rubber. That gives six times the number of rubber sheets per paper. Of course, because this is a steam blast furnace recipe, you're gonna need to stick some fluid ports on it. The fluid and item ports can coexist with each other, but of course it'll only process one recipe at a time. Also, if you don't have any sulfur, make sure you start macerating your coal ore. You should have silk touch from that steam mining drill, so you should have plenty of sulfur dust to work with. Put two sand together in the crafting table to get snad. Snad grows sugarcane faster than regular sand does. It brings that playground myth to life. I believe it also works on cactus, and soul snad works on nether wart. It's not like 
some versions of Snad where you can pulse it with redstone to instantly make it grow, but it definitely does improve on the speed of which you're growing your sugar cane. Now, if you're going to have your coke ovens running frequently to make as much coke dust as possible, you're going to definitely want to use a fluid trash can to make sure you're voiding the extra creosote. You still want to have some tanks ready to store the creosote, but you also want to make sure it's emptied so that it keeps processing. Also, something important about the coke oven is that you can process coal dust instead of just regular coal. This means you don't have to remacerate the coal coke into coal coke dust to process it with the steel. Now then, let's make some analog circuits. This is where EMI comes in really handy. You just need to make sure that you set it to make 8 circuits and that it'll tell you how to make 8 analog circuits. Though, upon further analysis, I think 16 might be a better number for your first batch. As I craft each individual component for these circuits, it'll progressively check them off the list on the sidebar there. And to get here, you click on that recipe tree button next to a given recipe. Make sure you've collected a fair amount of lead and antimony ore. Combine them in the mixer and you can make battery alloy. Then of course, use those to make batteries. You're gonna want a bunch of batteries early on. I don't have an exact amount of ore to collect, but thankfully the further we progress, the faster it gets to mine more of the ore, so, you know, we'll end up with a good amount of lead. But, with all of that together, we can make our first LV machine hull. This is our first step towards making and using machines. Well, uh, non-steam machines, I should say. Also, battery alloy is pretty much the only thing antimony is good for, other than, like, a couple of one-off crafts. So, I would recommend keeping it in its dust form. It's much more useful that way. Lead you might also want to keep as dust, but that's because it has a lot of things you need it for as a dust, rather than just having nothing to use in ingot form. What, you thought we were done with steam machines now that we have a machine hull? Of course not. We have plenty more to do with our steam infrastructure. The first thing I want is a cutting machine. This is going to be how we get our rods and bolts without having to use the forge hammer. It's also required for making rods and bolts of things like, say, Invar, and other alloys. The further we get through the game, the more machine reliance we're going to have, but that's just how automation is in general. What's important though is that, if you want an early diamond, you can claim it as a quest reward. This should definitely go towards a cutting machine. Otherwise, you're going to have to deal with Pneumaticraft, and, well, uh, that's a little much for the time being, I would say. Our creosote from the coke oven can be turned into lubricant in the mixer. This is also something that's required for using the cutting machine. Thankfully, it only uses one millibucket per operation, so it should last you a very long time until you start super automating your factory. Now, with all of those Invar components made, I can make a steam quarry, or at least the central block for it. This is going to be really useful for mining ores. It mines ores from the void, but we'll get to that later. I still need to finish the rest of the multi-block. Steel production is lacking, so it's time to set up another blast furnace, or should I say repurpose the oil furnace to also be a steel furnace. Remember that if you use a steel input port, it will double the speed at which it crafts the steel. And you can use gunpowder on the controller to make it craft the steel twice as quickly. The faster we get out of this stage of the game, the better, right? Alright, let's set this up. You probably want to have two separate output hatches on this. You'll see it when I show off our yield, but occasionally it can make more than one ore at a time, and sometimes it makes more than two ores at a time. So, by having two separate ports, we can handle up to four ores at a time being generated, and we don't end up wasting any. And it ends up being a decent amount, so be wary of it, and the investment is more than worth it. Like with all the other steam machinery, be sure to use a steel fluid input, and then a single bronze tier input should be sufficient for the final item port. To use this quarry, you simply need to put some of the bronze drills into the item input, and it'll start digging for ores. Of course, the electric quarry will handle all of the steam quarry's recipes. That's a trend with these. The electric blast furnace handles the steam blast furnace recipes, the electric quarry handles the steam quarry recipes, and for whatever else I w didn't just say right now, it also works. EMI simply always shows you the minimum required tier to do a particular craft. So, as you can see, both output chests have ores in them. I've only gone through about half of the drills at this point. 
who started with 8, I've used 4. The chance of getting consumed is random per recipe. Hopefully it lasts you a while, gets you enough to get on your feet, and automate up to having an infinite supply of them, or at least an easier way of crafting them. To handle a larger amount of steam machinery and electric machinery from steam turbines, we're going to need a large bronze boiler. Or I think it's the large steam boiler in this mod. Thankfully, we've already made the tree farm, so having charcoal for it isn't an issue. You also get six more heatproof casings for making your first one, so it's relatively inexpensive to get a first boiler off the ground. And I have pretty much everything on hand, so I'll just craft a bunch of machine parts and be back. You'll need a 3x3x4 area to house your large steam boiler. I'm also going to be running all of the pipes through the back. This is where the wall of this building is going to be. Yeah, I made a new building. In survival at that, with whatever materials I had on hand, gave me something to do while the steam quarry was running. In any case, make sure you have room for your three ports. Fuel in, water in, steam out. I'll be putting a steel pump at the bottom to get the water from the pump into the boiler. So now once I hook up all of the charcoal as fuel, and then I'll have to just prime the boiler with some water so that it has a little bit of steam it can make. That should send the steam down into the pump. The pump starts pumping water, and the water goes into the boiler, and we should have a functional system. Having all of these pipes be visible is rather ugly though, don't you think? Well, with the help of the pipe configuration card, we can shift right click on a block to set what we want to camouflage with, and it will take a block from that inventory every time we right click on a pipe to cover the pipe in that block. You can also shift right click to enable transparency so that you can see wherever you have pipes hidden by camouflage. Okay, so I've set up all of this steam machinery and it's going to automatically process my ores. To explain how it works, I've set a filter on each of the item pipes leading into the machines. They are all set to input and output. You can't just set it to output to the side of the machine and auto eject because there are many byproducts that wouldn't be properly handled in this manner. By using pipes, I can always make certain everything gets sent to the correct destination every time. Each row handles a different type of ore. The top one handles coal and redstone, the middle handles copper and tin, and the bottom handles gold and iron. I don't have a means of processing bauxite yet, so I'm not going to be doing that on the auto steam setup. We won't be using bauxite for quite a while. Maybe next episode, definitely the next one if not, but you know, we gotta wait. What I've explicitly done here is manage the priorities on each pipe so that it only sends it further down the line. That way I can have the filters not recursively send into the machines that they are currently using, if that makes sense. So what happens is the lowest inserting priority is on the ore end, and only ores enter that macerator. However, the extraction priority on that machine is one higher than the insert priority. This ensures that everything that gets extracted from the first column gets sent to the second column directly. And as we go down the line, we can look at each of the filters and see that the next one is sequentially higher than the previous and the next one is higher than that one. The terminus is the barrel at the end, which has the highest priority on the system. This also helps with intermediate byproducts that get produced, such as sulfur from macerating coal. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me, or check out my automation video. I have a separate video dedicated to that. It's also important to have some of these at a middling level of priority, because we can use these dusts to make alloys. I would definitely recommend setting it up so that you can take the dusts from your setup when necessary. Now's a good time to discuss slot locking. When you drag an item from EMI or JEI or whatever into a slot in a machine, it locks that item into that slot. No other items will be able to enter that slot. You can manually set each of the items for a particular recipe to make sure that only that recipe gets crafted in that machine. You can also shift-click the lock to lock every slot, as well as the unused slots to make sure that you aren't filling it with recipes you don't want. You might also have to do this with some byproducts. 
I remember with the Primogel goo, I ended up crafting mud by mistake the first time. At this stage, you should automate production of bronze and steel completely, you know, other than obtaining the raw ores, which you need bronze drills for. We'll get to that next time, though. I could use a few more diamonds. Thankfully, there's a place I can get some. I don't really feel like doing the pneumatic craft right now, so I'll go to the Undergarden and get some diamond ore there. You can smelt the diamond ore in the Undergarden to get diamonds without having to go through the compressing setup. You will need two diamond plates to make the catalyst to get there, but, huh, isn't that convenient? You get two diamond plates from a quest reward. I've also made a set of steel equipment for myself. It's not the best, but it's pretty good and pretty cheap at this stage for me. The mobs in the Undergarden can sometimes be a little annoying, so make sure you have adequate gear to deal with them. Steel is better than iron, though not as good as diamond. Make your portal frame out of stone bricks and light it with the catalyst. The best place to find diamonds is up along the roof of the Undergarden. They're not super frequently common, but they're common enough. I'd say maybe four or five are good, but you can always get more if you want diamond armor or some other various diamond things. I'm picking them up just so I can make some more cutting machines. Not that I use any extra cutting machines this episode. I'll be bouncing a bit here until the end of the episode. My goal is a metal press, but there are a few things I need to do along the way. The first, of course, is to get an engineer's workbench. This will allow me to make various crafting components, as well as some crafting components that I can already make, but cheaper. Here's a quick look at the machine wall, by the way. You can see that it's all finished, all clean, very neat. And it all processes things automatically when I put the ores into the bottom barrel. And then it gets all sent to the top barrel, of course. The first goal here is going to be an LV steam turbine. It's not really much of a contest because, well, obviously we need power to use any machines. And this isn't mechanism where you can just put redstone in a machine to make it work. Ultimately, I'd like to make an assembler today and a metal press. But in order to get there, we're going to need that turbine. You know how it is though, microcrafting's not very interesting, so I'll only show the important bits. Okay, one crafting session later, and we have the LV steam turbine. I'll probably place all of the steam stuff on the back wall, at least for the time being. Or, well, the electrical stuff. My apologies. I don't know exactly how I want this room to look, and I mean, I'm going to be making a lot of rooms. This is just a starter room for all of my early automation. I will be making a full-on base at some point. The first machine I'd recommend making is a polarizer. It costs six redstone to make a magnetic steel rod, but with the polarizer it just costs some energy, which basically means it's free. You just need the steel rod to make it magnetic. It's also the cheaper of the two machines we're looking at for the time being, so that's another incentive it's easier to make. A note when using steam turbines, they only export to the square side, that is by default on the back. You can of course shift right click with a wrench to change where the output is, they can input steam from the back, so don't worry about that, or any other face, of course. And then all you have to do is take some tin cable, run it along, and then make sure it connects to the machine that you place down. And there you go. Your polarizer is up and running. Now that we've made one machine, it's already time to make another. Next, of course, we need the assembler. The assembler is much more expensive, but thanks to our polarizer, it will be much cheaper, at least on redstone. All of this just to make some redstone engineering blocks for a metal press, huh? Well, of course, we have the assembler for everything else that requires an assembler. These robot arms are the real killer, though. They require so many things, and a lot of circuits, to one each. That's seven circuits, I believe, for one assembler. I hope you prepared a bunch in advance. You'll likely be wanting to only make one of each machine at the start. I wouldn't really recommend that once you have the materials to make more. This is getting a bit into what I'll be doing next episode, but my focus is going to be full automation of bronze and steel drills. That way I'll no longer have to worry about getting more materials. Beyond that, I'm going to start setting up a large amount of power production and have assemblers for a whole lot of different components. Just you wait, we're going to be getting a lot of progress in the next two episodes. 
A little diversion before we get into the metal press though. One thing I'd like to make is a hang glider. It's like an early form of an elytra. It's not great, but we can make it now that we have invar and rubber. It works exactly as you would expect a real hang glider to, you know, with the exception of random wind. Since I live so high up though, it's handy to have. The reason I'm going on this adventure though is to, um, relocate some villagers. If you shift right click on one with an empty hand, you'll pick it up and put it in your inventory. Then you can take a bunch of them back and use them for trading. I'll meet you back when I'm ready to make use of them. Now to make some traders. They're fairly cheap, just some iron, redstone, and glass panes. You can then put a villager into the trader as well as a job station. Of course, we're going to need to get some emeralds. There are numerous different trades you can get for emeralds. I believe some people like to use sticks. I'm just going to use iron because I have plenty of it, but a farmer might also be helpful to have some crops. The real prize though is the industrialist villager. That one can potentially trade us a bunch of useful components from modern industrialization. Of course, with all trades, it's random, so unless you really want to grind it out, you might not get exactly what you want. The job site for that one is the Forge Hammer, by the way. Here's a little sampling of what the industrialist can provide. I'm mostly excited for the copper rotors, as those are going to be useful for making fluid pipes much easier. At least before I have all the microcrafting set up. Gears and rotors can be a bit of a pain early on because I don't have any soldering alloy, as lead is exclusive to the steel drills in the electric quarry. I also have bronze rotors and steel upgrades, which are pretty useful. The other trades of note are motors and analog circuits, you know, in case you want to avoid all that micro-crafting. And now it's time to set up a metal press. It requires a bunch of relatively easy to get things. You can make electrum in the alloy kiln by smelting gold and silver. That's the heavy engineering block. Of course, the redstone engineering block's made in the assembler. That really just has an analog circuit as the only bad component. And then everything else is pretty straightforward. Form the multi-block, and we'll have the ability to make gears much easier and cheaper. Well, actually, it's not cheaper, but there's less microcrafting involved, and any less microcrafting is for the better. Especially when we're only losing a little bit of bronze, or steel, you know, things I automated. I didn't explicitly show the automation for steel, but I just hooked up the blast furnaces with the uh, automated uncooked steel dust. And I have a coke oven running. I did have to kickstart the system a few times though by putting more coal dust in. And there we go. Bronze gears made simply and easily. I would be careful about automating this. From what I've seen, the redstone might be a little buggy. Might have to get a little creative with how you set it up. Unless it just works for you, in which case, good. It'll do fine as a manual machine though for the time being. Thanks to that, it now isn't too bad to make more bronze drills. That means we can have the quarry running at all times. You just have to restock it every now and then. Of course, you'll need to be careful if you're on a server and it's loading while you're offline. But for me, I don't have that option this time, so I don't really have to think about that. But, uh, yeah, that's about it for today. We got a lot done, made it into electricity, automated most of the steam stuff. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. This is Pick. I'm glad to have seen you, and I hope to see you again.